Thank you for being here. We, uh, um, it is an honor. The ceremony has been breathtaking. And, uh, and I'm very honored to be here participating. And I wanted to say thank you to Laura, all of you, Abraham, uh, Lisette, Javier, Javier, Jose, Jose. Uh, todos han sido uh, inmenso, todo esto está puesto porque es una colaboración, aquí, aquí no hay uh, clases, es una familia, una familia que trabaja por proyecto y realmente es, eh, es, no es solamente un placer, es, es, es divino estar aquí, es realmente un, una sensación muy buena. Um, I'm very fan of talking in Spanish, mm -hmm. and if you don't understand, you have to remain, remind me that I am in mean, speaking English mood, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we begin this uh, um, this project that for no begin with this project because we were in the jungle in. in uh, I will say what I'll learn in Northeast Venezuela, Delta Matura State. Try to, try to uh, retrieve uh, the, the favor of the people working with us with the, our first work, uh, our first work in, with cholera in this area in 1993, 1994. And we published a book. We won a prize and they gave us a, a lot of money for us. It was uh, less than twenty thousand dollars, and we wanted to to work with this, trying to put in place a program for health. You know, que were uh, really accommodated to the what our people, religion, belief, uh, environment, everything. In the spirit of this task, we were calling for our beloved friend, our uh, brothers and sister Waral, because they were uh, very anxious and, and with a lot of fear, because in 2008, they have an outbreak that was going on of children that and no one uh, were Diagnostic, uh, what what will happen with the death? The children begin to die. Families uh, lost three children in one family, two children, in, and most of them were no one give even the medical authorities give them the cause of the death of their children, and it was really the situation. They call us. They said, this is an anecdotic, it looked like an anecdotic. They called us, you have to work with us. And, and, and they said, and you, you have to be the anthropologist. <coughs> and you, Clara, you have to be the doctor. And, and we, we see each other, we say, okay, I am a doctor, he's an anthropology, we can work, we can work this. But the, 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 the behind this this uh, asking this petition, it was like a, we trust you. We have many anthropologists, many doctors that came, and no one helped us really with interest. I don't mean that we resolved the, the crisis of everything, but the interest, the commi the commitment to work with the people, that was that facilitate that we say yes and they ask us to work with them. I think I'm extending me too much. I, I like to talk, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> I will pass. Gracias, Laura. Gracias, Don Pascual. Me siento muy honrado de estar con ustedes. Gracias por lo que es ese encuentro con el pueblo Barao. I feel very honored to be with all of you. Thank you, Don, Don Pascual. To uh, Laura, we have two, doc two doctoras and three elders with us tonight. Um, we are here under false pretenses because this is the Latinx Research Center, and this was not research. 
we were there trying to set up a health project in indigenous communities mm -hmm. where something around 30% of the children die in the first year of life, 30%. And trying to work with them to be able to, to find out a way in which things could really be transformed. And people grabbed us and said, that's a nice project, but right now all of the children in our community are dying. And for a year, epidemiologists and physicians have not been able to figure out what this disease is. And, and I'll tell you, why couldn't they figure that out? Because the parents often were spending weeks, they were taking child after child to doctors, to healers, to epi they were taking them to the city, they were in the intensive care unit, and no one ever stopped to ask the parents what they thought was going on. Because the parents were indigenous people. They were seen as being incapable of even understanding what doctors told them, let alone of producing their own knowledge about it the disease. So when we came along, two very dear friends, Conrado and Liberap, I should say, um, there are many sad things about tonight. One is that they're not here with us uh, because we, they unfortunately could not come out of the Delta to join us. We thought maybe we could do it electronically by Skype, but there no internet connection. We couldn't get them to, there was no way they could come to town, but they would have been wonderful. So basically what they said is, all right, the doctors have failed over the course of a year to understand what this disease is, so we, the indigenous people, we're going to produce knowledge about this disease. So we went around to every single community, there were 14 in total, where people had died from this mysterious disease, and we held these encounters where we had healers tell what they knew. The mothers and the fathers told their stories about what they had observed. Right? And then we also, even in some cases, as you will see in the other room there, were there when someone had died from this disease. And the mothers, ordinarily, and sometimes like that father, performed laments, ritual wailing, where they said, what killed my child? And they threw out hypotheses. They also gave observations in their narratives, and they demanded, our children, in Judith Butler's terms, are grievable. Their deaths matter because their lives matter. We want to publicly, with people in the community all gathered together, we want people to know about this. We want to give what we often call in Spanish testimonios that really talked about what their lives, the value of their lives, and what we went through to be able to save their lives. And it was the basis of this, it was like, oh, okay, it was pretty soon it was the same narrative, that symptom, that symptom, that symptom, that symptom. When you get a really good doctor like Dr. Clara, even with a disease that almost no doctors have ever seen before, rabies, it was pretty easy to figure out what was going on and to figure out it was being transmitted by bats. But this became a novel certification where indigenous knowledge was put up front, indigenous leadership and health. And so they said, all right, we've now figured this out. We're taking our own report to the National Health Ministry. And when they said that, we just almost died. Because if you can imagine the rainforest, where the, the, in the regional, the small capital, where the economy is run on the basis of race, indigenous, non-indigenous, to have indigenous people actually come in and say, we've got results about it, we've got our own statistics, was quite um, earth-shattering. But to go to the national capital and to confront national officials and say, there's been an epidemic of a communicable disease that you don't know about going on for a year was big. And so in the middle of this, um, international journalists, New York Times, all of the health reporters in the country came, and here you had four indigenous leaders who had never seen a journalist before became the most amazing, eloquent spokespersons, not only for talking about what had happened, right? but also performing that indigenous peoples were producers of health knowledge, but way beyond that. They're saying, no, this was always about more than stopping this epidemic. This was about having, generating a utopian vision of what life could be like, of when there can be un encuentro entre saberes, when there are encounters between forms of knowledge, where there's lateral communication, where there's respect, and where indigenous people have the right to participate actively in the production of knowledge about health conditions and the making of policies and practices within their own community. For two weeks, the national press was absolutely filled with these four people 
on national television, in the papers every day, and there are 30,000 press stories worldwide of these four indigenous leaders talking about health. That was an amazing utopian moment. So why are we sitting, why are all these photographs here? Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, primarily because they said, we want lots of people to know what happened. We want lots of people to see our children. And their language is primarily not textual. There's a problem, first of all, you know, some of the, the idea was that getting the printed word out might not be the most effective form for everyone, right? So what they wanted was, first of all, to have photographs. So I had had a brief career a long time ago as a photographer, and I kind of, and I had a, I had a camera along, but I kind of had to pull this sense of, of how it is that one encounters the world collaboratively through the lens of a camera out from deep within me and try to produce photographs that could respond to that moment, which I would say was one of the worst experiences of my life because we encountered this not as people encountering another, but as ourselves grieving parents who are asked to be able to stand with other grieving parents to be able to understand what was going on with the family deaths. So these are the photographs that what our people wanted. And they wanted each one of you to be here. We wrote a book in Spanish with our other, our four collaborators, which is not an academic book. It was published by the leading social medicine press in Argentina. But it was a group of dialogues between the four of us about what happened, about what health conditions are, are like, what happens when race and health combined in lethal ways, and about what a new world could look like. But here, the photographs, they really wanted other people to know about their struggles and to offer what their vision was and their experience as the beginning of an encounter. So, we were, we've actually done this around the world, right? But there's one place we have never done it, because in Berkeley, because I thought, where could we do this in Berkeley? <laughs> and then along came Laura and said, what could be better? We said, we don't want a photographic ex ex uh, exhibition. We want un encuentro entre pueblos indígenas en cuanto a la salud, la muerte, el luto y los sueños. We want to have an encounter with indigenous, between indigenous peoples that's about life and death, health, and it's about struggles for justice um, and for better futures. So this is a whole lot better than anything you could possibly have imagined. So we, um, we want to have a conversatorio. We're hoping that maybe you also might be able to look at the photographs. We have two photographs, one of a woman who was so that she lost her daughter. And that was so difficult for her. She seemed to have just moved into a, a world inside of her. A year later, she was just in that same state. There's another photograph out front. The others are one family. That is Elvia Flores Rivas. And she was, um, we encountered her. She was, um, Claudia was asked to see her as a doctor, and she was symptomatic of this disease. Mm -hmm. And so we were only able to give palliative care. There's very little help for rabies victims, all the mm -hmm. new ideas about that. So she was able to ease her pain and be able to accompany the family. And they said, we want people to see what happened to our daughter. The grandfather here said, we want, I, I love it when you, you said, when you were looking at the grandfather, you said, we appeal to the grandfathers and grandmothers, and there he was, this wonderful in ceremony. So them saying, we want people to, ex to be with us in this room. If you move then into the other room, which is the library, that room is kind of cordoned off because that in, has pictures of Envia when she's no longer alive and of her relatives mourning over her. But that is a space where one experiences where you can look at right, what happened um, in terms of the family's experience. But don't forget to also go back through where you got your food because this is not about suffering. This is not about trying to make you feel badly for anyone. This is about about dreams and about the work of achieving justice in health. And think about the smiling faces at the end of people who have to say, it's now time to get on with life. So, you know, we're sorry that we're here rather than Liberado um, and Conrado, 
Nora Bailis, who was the indigenous nurse who worked with us, and particularly Tirso, who was our friend, a dear friend who was a healer, who unfortunately himself died um, after the epidemic. So we wish they were with you. I think they're with you in spirit tonight. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And so um, we would like to hear from uh, all of you uh, if there's any, you know, um, thoughts or, or projects and communities here that you're engaged in. We'd love to hear. Um, Thank you for being here and for this beautiful exhibit that you put together. I guess my question is, um, what happened once they took all their bindings to the national, uh, you said the national assembly or something? Health ministry. Health, yeah, a health ministry. Because from what I know, like Venezuela prides itself in having like really high, well maybe not high, but like good standards of health care. So I'm wondering like how they, maybe they didn't know and then once they knew, did they act on it? The public health official and physician. <laughs> yeah. um, well, yes, and it's going to have a very good public health. Um, unfortunately, I have to say that, first of all, I, I will bring the, the, the word of uh, uh, Anaya that was a relator of oh, my granddaughter is there. Hola, <laughs> Gabriele. <laughs> Hola. Um, Anaya, eh, relator de la ONU hace unos cuantos años en, 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 ese, en esa asamblea, y él dijo, uh, dictatorship, democracy, Socialism, whatever regime, the indigenous are always down, you know. And there is no doubt that Venezuela has achieved a, a better way of public health, but this is unfortunately main in Caracas and the big urban cities. Indigenous still have a long way to there have been some changes for the best, but still the mentality that they are indigenous, that they are indigenous, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they haven't overcome that. So these were the pioneers of socialism in Venezuela. Before Chavez, in the rainforest, people who actually were carving out indigenous socialism and thinking about it really what it really meant to have um, egalitarianly organized community. Folks who've been involved in the Movimiento um, Socialismo, Socialist Party, um, and they really believed in Chavez's project. And they believed in Chavez's when he held out his constitution with Articles 83 and 84, which guaranteed a fundamental social right to health and health care. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> Don't you like that? And they challenged a petro-socialist state, and they said, you know, fossil fuel extraction should not be the basis for building socialism. Unfortunately, in that, people were not listened to, to there. If they had, Venezuela would be in a lot better shape right now. So we went to the health ministry, um, and what happened, the idea that you have indigenous people standing in the health ministry delivering health results was so bizarre for them, they also realized, what the hell's going on? These regional health officials have not told us about an outbreak of a communicable disease over the course of a year. So it looked real bad for them because afterward they were not delivering on the promise of, of the social revolution, of the Bolivarian revolution. So the regional government said, oh, you've got to shut these people down. So there was, a re there was a big fight within the government, right? On the one hand, they put the four of them on national television during the middle of the day in the most, one of the most, of, you know, uh, the programs that had the largest audience. On the other hand, we went back to the Delta um, Amakuro and they, um, they held her for questioning for three days. So there was kind of an ambivalent response. But in the end, unfortunately, I mean, there was a recognition nationally that you cannot treat indigenous people as if they have no health rights and as if they don't know what's going on. 
but um, you know, my experience is that racial economies are regional, not national. So the idea that in Caracas there is a pro-indigenous, pro-poor government at that time, in particularly important ways, didn't necessarily make it to an area where the um, state lives off of basically suctioning off all the money from the national government intended for indigenous peoples and keeping it intact. It's a great question. Don Pascual, no, no sé si usted um, quiera compartir algunas ideas más. Um, han estado uh, platicando los, los breaks acerca de uh, la, la racialización, ¿verdad? Un poco de que aunque eh, la salud pública en Venezuela es muy buena, eh, que sin embargo siempre sigue ¿verdad? el problema de la racialización, ¿verdad? el racismo contra los pueblos indígenas y um, en, entonces no sé si hay algunas, algunos pensamientos y observaciones también dijo el profesor Briggs que la idea de las comunidades ¿verdad? más egalitarias se encuentran entre esas comunidades tradicionales y ahí hay los modelos de maneras de la comunidad de, um, de, pues de, de organizarse de una manera más respetuosa ¿no? No sé si quisiera añadir algunos pensamientos desde la perspectiva um, de las comunidades la maya y lo que usted ha observado aquí. Bueno, uh, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Eh, sí, la, la pregunta y, el, y el, la conversación de todo lo que han compartido ellos que han vivido y han contactado y vivieron allá con, con, con estas comunidades. Yo diría, cuando hablamos de los problemas de pueblos indígenas, y siempre damos un paso así en la política de los sistemas de gobiernos desde aquí hasta, hasta el sur, quieras o no. Como dijo alguien aquel día, estábamos hablando un tema relacionado también a estos problemas de pueblos indígenas. Dice, Pascual, te estás metiendo en política. Nunca, nunca podemos cerrar eh, y nunca podemos tapar el sol con un dedo. Y entonces eso es exactamente. En los pueblos indígenas, tanto los, el, el pueblo maya, en, en el área de Guatemala, México, Honduras, El Salvador, es el área maya, el sur de México. Ah, los análisis que están es que eh, los pueblos indígenas nunca es reconocido en ningún sistema, ni de salud, si veamos las constituciones de, de, de los gobiernos desde aquí hasta el sur solo reconocen que, que hay nativos en, en los territorios hasta ahí nada más pero no hablan de sus maneras de vida de sus problemas de sus enfermedades de sus situaciones de su manera de entender las políticas nunca se habla entonces Específicamente en el caso de la salud, los pueblos indígenas también, muchos de los pueblos indígenas tienen grandes, yo diría, avances en sus medicinas, ¿ya? pero no son, como no son reconocidos, por ejemplo, aquí a lo mejor sé un poquito de medicina indígena, pero si yo recomiendo medicina indígena aquí, no es, no es legal, así se dice. Entonces, igual está en los países, sí hay pueblos, territorios indígenas o habitantes indígenas, pero no son reconocidos sus pensamientos en todo eso en las constituciones, entonces 
ahí quedamos, ahí estamos. Se pierden los conocimientos, se pierden los idiomas, se pierden la, las esencias culturales. Eso es lo que, lo que está dando hasta ahora. ¿ya? Entonces, y si, uh, y si vemos, oh, están muriendo de una de una de unas enfermedades de los pueblos, oh, porque son sucios, porque no, no pueden, porque no comen bien, porque comen cualquier cosa. Eso es lo que nos dicen desde los pueblos indígenas. ¿ya? El caso de Guatemala, este, yo vengo en el occidente de Guatemala, donde es la habitante, es la, la, los habitantes es como un, un unos 5 a 8 millones de, de habitantes, igual necesitan agua potable, necesitan caminos para transportar sus enfermos, necesitan comida, necesitan las, se han de, destruido las semillas, eh, ha entrado las semillas a, eh, transgénicas, eh, todo eso, se han metido, eh, se han metido otros, los productos dañinos, como las gaseosas, todo eso, ¿ya? entonces no, no hay un control en todo eso. ¿ya? Bueno, en primer lugar, este, yo pienso que lo que usted está diciendo sobre los problemas de los indígenas, o sea, no es algo que es o sea, solamente con la salud o solamente con los sistemas de comida, ¿no es cierto? Porque, o sea, históricamente el desarrollo del mundo prácticamente siempre, como usted ha dicho, ha mantenido a la gente indígena en, en, o sea, en una forma inferior, ¿no es cierto? So I think like with, when we're considering indigenous issues, so my family specifically, uh, my grandma's from Andahuaylas, and so we're like indigenous from the Andes, uh, you know, Quechua speakers. So these are issues that I think are like really critical to a lot of us as well, who are like descendants of indigenous people and like the preservation of this sort of, at least me personally, this like Andean cosmology, right? And so I think like historically within our development, this like childlike notion of indigenous people has become very deeply ingrained um, in a lot of the social issues that we're seeing now. And so, for example, like, you know, un ejemplo, por, por decir, en, si tú vas a Lima, Perú, si tú ves por ahí Barranco, por Miraflores, o sea, siempre están las, las mujeres indígenas de una forma romantizadas, ¿no? O sea, la experiencia de estas mujeres, o sea, no se conoce su sufrimiento, no se conoce realmente, o sea, su estilo de vida, sus necesidades, como usted dice, pero ellas están ahí como para que los turistas vayan a ver alguna, o sea, la historia de Perú. Entonces están ahí como, they're, it's like, a, it's like a theater, essentially, like indigenous women and Andean women in Perú serve, essentially, uh, you know, to be like this sort of show for tourism, right? En México, por ejemplo, también, o sea, que literalmente en México el gobierno ha ido para, o sea, sin, sin que las mujeres supieran, o sea, sacar de la capacidad de tener hijos, o sea, like, to essentially rob women of their reproductive rights, it's like one of the most, uh, like, when we talk about human rights, like, that's probably one of the biggest, just like robbing someone of their reproductive rights, it's just like absolutely disgusting, and so, um, you know, one movement that I think is like critically important to acknowledge is like agroecology and the way that agroecology is essentially calling forth indigenous knowledge and using indigenous knowledge uh, to fight back against like neoliberal models that have impeded against the most basic as well as like food production, right? And so, you know, this is one critically important aspect to consider is like health and how, like you said, right, health and race um, are very intertwined and how, you know, these people are Again, considered so childlike that we could never believe that they have the capacity to produce this sort of knowledge. Um, but it also has to do with, you know, robbing them of their ability to maintain their own livelihoods. Um, and so it's unfortunately a problem that I think is it's so complex and it has so many aspects. Um, 
But I think even the fact that we're able to sit here, you know, at an institution like Berkeley and have this sort of dialogue and be conscious of it is, is a step in the right direction. So I think this is awesome. I'm very grateful for this. So nobody put a favor. Uh, Tommy, I'm a third year at Cal, so. <laughs> I wanted to say something uh, on that. Um, as a physician, I um, when I began to work in the jungle, just recently graduated in Venezuela, Amazon, I saw that uh, they call it operativos, and they go to communities, and they go to extract needles, uh, to cut the hair, to to sterilization, quick Sorry. sterilization. Mm -hmm. And um, and sometimes they, they left the person with uh, um, this sterilization and they don't come back to see if the woman is, is fine. You know, there are no follow-up. Well, now it's improving a little bit because the international attention. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to say something in agreement with Don Pascual, if you let me. Uh, si me permite, por favor. Es que, um, y voy a decirlo en español para, que, eh, para usted, precisamente es que aquí en Estados Unidos la población abajo sufrió de un, un, un brote de hantavirus. Y el CDC, personas del CDC, fueron a investigar de qué se estaban muriendo porque no sabían. Y lo primero que hicieron fue ir a la cocina de los indi, de las casas del, de los navajos y ver si eran limpios. ¿Sí? Eso fue lo primero que hicieron. Y estaban pendientes de la higiene, como usted dice. Están tratando y siempre hay ese, esa clase de supremacía. ¿verdad? que la gente se abroga por tener un título de doctor o de antropólogo y me perdonan los antropólogos que están por ahí, o, o, o cualquier título de estudio ¿sí? porque la gente piensa porque tengo un título yo, yo sé, yo soy el poseedor del conocimiento y lo demás no importa entonces un poco tratando de hacer una mala traducción de lo que acabo de decir es <laughs> the, the, the professionals always go to the, to the indigenous community looking for hygiene. Mm -hmm. And those that of those children at the beginning and also at the end, because the government didn't recognize that they died from rabies. And I can, I can justify just that because as you see the, the the video, as you see, the way that they live, they don't have too much dog, you know? And it's difficult because people, for more than 50 years, rabies wasn't known in this kind of community. Mm -hmm. It's now with the global warming that bats begin to attack people more frequently. Mm -hmm. But this is mm, something that we have to develop more. But, um, and, and they didn't know that was rabies, but they didn't listen to the indigenous community. They always said they died for the normal diarrhea that kill the Indian because they are dirty. Listen, see what Gracias. It's my worst. <laughs> Sí, entonces um, yo creo que una de las cosas, one of the things that has been put out, una de las cosas que está surgiendo entre la conversación aquí es, es uh, eh, la que está surgiendo ¿no? el, el conocimiento más amplio de que en los pueblos ¿verdad? originarios que han sobrevivido, que están todavía con nosotros, que estamos viendo más y más que pues en primer lugar han sobrevivido y con ellos han sobrevivido los conocimientos. Usted, don Pascual, habló hace unos momentos, hizo referencia a que hay grandes hallazgos ahorita entre las comunidades indígenas en su propia manera de pensar de la salud, aunque quizá 
en el mundo occidentalizado aún no se está poniendo suficiente atención, pero me parece que ese es como un, una, como un, un rayo ¿no? de esperanza. Um, I think that one of the things that Pascual said in his comments was that among, in the Maya community, there's been a lot of research around medicine from a Maya perspective. So there's been uh, their breakthroughs in healing and research that is, that is going on in these communities. And I'm saying that it seems that that's like a, a ray of hope, a ray of esperanza, uh, que estén surgiendo como medicinas. That they're that they're emerging as medicines as well. ¿verdad? So, sí creo que eso es algo que quizá podríamos apoyar, verdad? We could maybe support that. Podríamos apoyar en escuchar y conversar con esas, you know, maneras también de entender el mundo que no son simplemente las occidentales, ¿no? Yeah. Yeah. So other, you know, I mean, I find that a very you know, exciting and hopeful, especially from a research point of view and a, and a kind of a global point of view that we're trying to work in, in our planet towards greater respect for each other. And if we respect each other, then we also respect our knowledges and our traditions. And that's a place of hope for me that we might be able to weave our knowledges, not be opposed to each other, but weave our knowledges. Si pudiéramos, verdad, tejer esos conocimientos y no oponernos, ¿verdad? No es Occidente contra eh, los mundos tradicionales, pero trabajar juntos, ¿verdad? Sí, que, sí eh, esta mañana yo tuve una reunión en el lado de Marín uh -huh. uh, con un, un grupo de personas eh, indígenas de aquí, uh -huh. y, pero tres de ellos vienen en la reservación Jupa. Ellos están diciendo que, o sea, lo fuerte desde hace no se sabe cuántos años, pero ellos hablan de 15, 20 años, pero más en los últimos 5, 6, el, la, la, el porcentaje de suicidios indígenas, de jóvenes indígenas, a hombres, más en jóvenes, hombres, es altísimo mm -hmm. en, en, esa, en, en, en todas las reservaciones. Mm -hmm. El alcoholismo, la droga, es, es increíble. Mm -hmm. Pero ellos dicen, eh, eh, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Si no, si, si no, son, no son respetados nuestras, nuestras medicinas. Mm -hmm. Nosotros sabemos algunas medicinas, mm -hmm. podemos dar pero no, no, no podemos suministrar estas medicinas porque no es aprobado por el Departamento de Salud. Entonces es la gran preocupación que tienen estas personas y están estudiando cómo ser aprobado esto en los próximos tiempos, sí. pero sí está ese nivel de, de, de problema sí. en, en el caso de la salud that he was meeting this morning with um, uh, some members of indigenous communities and they were talking about uh, the suicides, the very high suicide rate that exists among indigenous youth and also um, uh, alcoholism and that they were saying that they actually have some medicine for these things but that they're not legally approved. And so they are working on getting some of these medicines approved. Yes, please. Uh, one thing that often happens in places like Berkeley is that we get disciplined. So we get locked into these small little disciplines and also then you close the sort of borders of knowledge production of the university. This is where academic knowledge is and that's where it ends. You are here, in case you didn't notice, in the Latinx Research Center which has brought together people from at least the folks I know here represent quite a number of different areas at Berkeley. I don't even know if you've probably ever encountered the same group of people. It's remarkable that we're here and many people in an exchange of knowledge with Don Pascual, with other elders, also who are part of knowledge production, very um, of knowledge production centers from beyond Berkeley. So this is a remarkable center and maybe Laura could tell us some of the wonderful work that's being done, including now where, where one of the foci of the center is health. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, 
Yeah, no. Um, dice el profesor Briggs que para él este centro, este nuevo centro, eh, ha traído que hay tanta gente en esta comunidad universitaria de diferentes comunidades latinas y que es que para él es como muy interesante que se han podido traer en diferentes momentos a uh, diferentes partes de nuestra comunidad más amplia. Y creo que lo único que yo añadiría, me, me alegro mucho que esa sea la experiencia del, del profesor Briggs. Uh, I'm very happy that it's Professor Briggs' experience that the center has been able to bring together the many different communities that we have on campus. I think that we're that we are in a, in a moment where you know we have these we still have these tensions of eurocentric knowledges and i think that the moment creo que estamos en un momento donde tenemos muchas tensiones por el conocimiento que continúa siendo eurocéntrico que se ha creído universal it's believed itself to be universal pero creo que el momento es tan ya grave i think the moment is so grave que ya, ya no es un momento para simplemente oponernos. It's not a moment of oppositions. It's a moment of moving beyond oppositions and a movement, I think, of, of finding each other and listening to each other. Creo que es un momento de, de encontrarnos y escucharnos y compartir, ¿verdad? Y tejer, como decía hace unos momentos, nuevas, nuevas uh, conexiones, ¿verdad? Y apoyarnos en los conocimientos que se han visto como alternativos. Right, it's a moment to support ourselves in the knowledges that have been marginalized and considered alternative. You know, the Latino, the, the Latinx Research Center is not the Center for Latin American Studies, of which I'm a member, right? So I have a great deal of respect, you know, for that work because Latin America has been treated as a third world nation, right, and suffered many different interventions. And it's a fabulous, incredible place full of so many cultures. La Latinoamérica es un lugar muy grande también con muchas culturas y avances que también ha experimentado esta marginalización a nivel global. Entonces, como tenemos círculos donde se repite este tipo de marginalización, pues ya llegó el momento donde las gentes, creo, de color, como las llamamos aquí, la gente de color, la gente marginalizada por ser de raíces indígenas, raíces africanas, diaspóricas, asiáticas, mixtos, pues eso es lo que somos, ¿verdad? Incre in, eh, incrementalmente, ¿verdad? Seguimos mezclando, ¿no? Y, y tenemos que ayudar al planeta, ¿no? Eh, honrando nuestras diferentes tradiciones, creo yo. Y cuando menos este espacio es para poder apoyar las diferentes voces para que aprendamos, you know, eh, una comunidad, comunidad de otra. So it's simply, it's my hope that this space can be one where we can learn from each other, you know, respectfully. And so when we talk about decoloniality, cuando hablamos de lo de colonial, es una palabra que ahorita está como muy de boga otra vez. Y está pues bien, ¿no? De colonial, pero ¿qué significa de colonial? Right? It's a cool word right now. And it's a, a really great word, and it, it has surfaced many times, at least since the 40s and the 50s. And I think that part of it, at least for myself, is that can we really begin to do, like Professor Briggs said, uh, podemos, ¿qué puede ser lo de colonial? Y para mí, me pregunto que si de veras podemos escucharnos, si de veras podemos eh, crear algo nuevo. Can we really listen to each other and create something new and support each other? Can we support each other and respect each other, no matter what our own personal you know, community is? I think we can move forward. Tengo mucha esperanza. Que, que aprendiendo a respetar y a centrar los conocimientos ancestrales ¿verdad? de nuestros abuelitos y abuelitas, um, sean de este continente o de otro, que vamos a hacer otra cosa diferente, to step outside the box, as you were saying, right? De no, como Pascual siempre dice, eh, eh, que hay que pensar, que no hay que pensar cuadrado. ¿verdad? Pascual always teaches that we must not think in a square way. I think what, what uh, Professor Briggs was getting at is that um, unruly thinking, undisciplined thinking, is a very, very interdisciplinary thinking, transnational thinking, is a very exciting way forward when we do it with the intention of, of trying to create like more democratic
cultures. So um, thank you for that. But I, you know, I just put my plug in uh, for the Maddox <laughs> Research Center. Uh, I certainly did not expect to do that, but as you see, I took advantage of it. But really, I, I think it must, that must be a cue, right? I realized yes. that was the cue. Uh, well, I welcome you all back to get on our website, take a look at what's happening, contact us, and let us know if you have ideas or projects or things that you want to do here. People have had retreats here, um, and uh, we, you know, we're really very open. It's very organic. We really want to support what the community itself is bringing forth. So thank you once again. I want to thank the Calculi, uh, Uwe Papalote, and and La Maestra, that is, uh, who has brought the Calpuli to UC Berkeley. I mean, that to me right there is like, uh, that to me that we have within the university, right, this other university, Akalmikak, which was the traditional school, right, of higher learning, and that the, the prayer dancing is also the learning the philosophy, as Marcelo Garzo, who was, you know, in charge of the drawing, his own dissertation work, is very much about showing that uh, ancestral spirituality was centered in science. And so thank you again to the Calpuri, thank you to Marcelo, who's very much a part of the process. To all of you, thank you. Once again, thank you to the <laughs>